Welcome to the second day of or your work day conference. I don't have to talk too long, but just to give you a bit of you know a background again of why we chose this topic and why we feel like it's something important um, you know, for youth and especially, you know, people um, going through school, trying to get an education, you know, young adults trying to work, still trying to figure out their life. And sometimes you get so overwhelmed and obsessed with, you know, what school am I going to go to? You know, what's my career going to be? I mean, um, who am I going to marry? That sort of thing. We, you know, try to plan our lives ourselves, but the more that we rely on ourselves, the more we realize we can't do it without someone else. And, you know, for the four-day conference that we have with our special guest, um, Pastor Cadiz, you know, we really want to delve deeper into um, what's the bigger picture. So, welcome, and I hope you guys enjoy the evening. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good to be here with you again. Uh, I hope you guys had a great day. It's good to see um, your faces, some familiar, some new. Happy to have you with us again. Uh, we're just going to dive right into our presentation for the evening. Um, but before we do that, I just want to remind everybody that um, I'm very open. If you want to ask me questions or come and speak to me about something, I'll make myself available to you. Um, not only that, but not only that, um, but I hope that we have a great time together. Um, yesterday I shared my testimony and my story with you about some of the things that I've been through and um, my struggles with work. Um, a lot of what I share with you this week and weekend will come from my personal experience. It will come from mistakes that I've, either I've made or very close friends of mine or family members of mine have made and me learning from their lessons, me learning their lessons or me learning from, from my own mistakes. Um, so a lot of this material is personal to me. Um, and I don't mind sharing it with you, so if you have questions, please just, you know, feel free to ask. Um, yesterday, when I was sharing my testimony with you, I was talking about how, while I was struggling for work and struggling to just be everybody that, I tried, struggling to be who everybody else expected me to be, playing all these roles and these positions, and being who people expected me to be, that I opened my Bible, and I just, I found a worth there that I couldn't find um, in, in social media, that I couldn't find in my relationships, that I couldn't find in my grades, that I couldn't find in so many other places, um, although I was excelling and doing well in those areas, I felt like it was all shallow because um, I knew that if those things went, that the people who, who I thought appreciated me would, may not appreciate me the same way. Um, and tonight, I'm just going to share with you one of the stories that I read that really influenced me and that helped me as well. Um, I hope none of you guys mind praying. Well, I'm going to start out with prayer, and then we're going to dive into it. Father in heaven, we just thank you for your love and for your grace. God, we thank you for this opportunity to gather together. We just ask that you would be with us and that you would bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So, um, the one, one of the stories that I read that had a huge impact on my life was um, found in the book of 1 Samuel. And, it's, and we're going from chapter, chapter 1, reading from, one, from verses 1 to 6. Now, uh, this is Old Testament stuff. So get ready for some names that are kind of hard to pronounce. For me, it'll be pretty easy. I went to school for this stuff. But um, just be ready for it. Um, it says, Now there was a certain man in Ramathiam, Zophim, of the mountains of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah. What was his name? Elkanah. Okay. His name was Elkanah, the son of, Jer of, Jer of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zoph, and Ephraimite. Now, that whole bunch of names there, right? What's really important to notice that there was a man over here named Elkanah. And he had two wives. How many wives did he have? Two wives. Two. He had two wives. Now, I've heard that having one wife is hard enough. This man managed to have two. He must have been pretty gutsy. He had two wives. The name of one was Hannah. What was her name? Hannah. And the name of the other was Peninnah. What was her name? Peninnah. So he was married to a woman named Hannah and then also another woman named Peninnah. Now, as you can imagine, if being married to only one woman and not that women are bad, but you know, relationships can be, can be challenging. Um, if, 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 don't stone me, right? If, if being married to one woman can be challenging, being married to two, you're going to see the drama that ensues. Um, but Hannah, it, it says Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up from the city yearly to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord of hosts in Shiloh. Also, the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, the priests of the Lord were there. So this man is consistently going up to um, work in the temple. 
And whenever the time came for Elkanah, this is the husband, to make an offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, his wife, and to all her sons and daughters. See this in your mind. He would come back with some food, and he would give some of the food to Peninnah and, and her children. But to Hannah, he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord had closed her womb, a.k.a. she was not able to have any children. It says that he would give a double portion, for he loved Hannah, although the Lord, although the Lord had, clothed, had closed her womb. And her rival also provoked her severely to make her miserable, because the Lord had closed, had closed her womb. So in Hannah's scenario here, Hannah is a woman who is married, and she's married to a man who happens to be also, also married to another woman. And she's upset and she's distraught over, the, over her plight because her sister wife, if you want to call her that, is giving birth to child after child after child. And Hannah here has no children. She's weeping and she's crying and she's upset because she's not able to produce that which she thinks a woman should be able to produce. And for her, her value in her mind and in the minds of others around her is dropping because in, in, in biblical times, um, there were two basic ways that women could contribute to society. One, they could contribute by continuing the lineage of their husbands, aka having sons, or they could, contrib they, or they could contribute to their society by, by giving birth to a male who could, possibly, who could possibly be the next messiah. So in her society and in her contest, giving birth to a male was one of the greatest things that you could do. Not only did it continue the lineage of your husband, but also it, it added to the culture and added to the society spiritually because they felt like any male who was born could possibly be the Messiah that they've been waiting for. Now in Hannah's mind, she's not living up to expectations. In Hannah's mind, maybe she had the wedding, she had everything that she expected, and she finally thinks, okay, I'm going to have children. I'm always going to do what, what I thought I wanted to do. How many of us in the room um, plan on having kids when we, get, when we get, get older or married, right? And how many of us already have a number in mind of how many kids you want to feed and that's why I need, right? I always tell people I want to have pets because pets don't have to go to college. You don't have to pay tuition for them. Um, but, you know, one day, one day, I hope to have, I hope to have children. It's okay to laugh at these things. It's okay. Nobody's going to judge you. So... Um, Hannah is in this predicament where she is measuring her worth by what she's able to produce and by what she has. And in a world that is so materialistic, in a world that is so capitalistic, it's very easy to measure your worth by what you have. In fact, today, just today, I decided to Google how much is Bill Gates worth. And I used those words intentionally to see if I would get the response that I expected. So I looked up. Just how much is Bill Gates worth? Oh, well, Bill Gates is worth 82 million. Warren Buffett is worth 73 billion. Sorry, not million, billion. That's with the B. <laughs> David Thompson, the richest Canadian. Do you guys know who this is? No? Okay, you know who this is. Okay, I thought maybe the army in Canada, maybe I should pull them out, right? <laughs> the richest Canadian in the world, right? His name is David Thompson, and he is worth, and this is what, this, I put in the word worth, intentionally. And um, Google told me that, in fact, this is found on the Forbes list, a list of richest people in the world, that David Thompson is worth $22 billion, right? Um, Oprah Winfrey, who I think everybody knows, is worth only $3 billion dollars. But it's interesting how, um, how, we're, how we're comfortable assigning a worth, assigning worth to people based upon what they have. Now, all of us can look into our bank accounts or look at our meal cards and de determine our worth based upon those things, or look at our grades and determine our worth based upon those, or you know, our potential schools or potential um, uh, careers. I remember when I was planning on going to law school, my worth in people's minds was very high. Like, girls were very interested in Edsel that was going to law school. Then when Edsel came around and said that Edsel's not going to law school, Edsel's going into ministry, then all of a sudden, that worth that they had in, of me in their mind suddenly diminished, right? So I began to ask myself, okay, well, if this is what the world thinks that these people are worth, does that mean that they are any better than you or I? Does that make them intrinsically better than you or I? I don't think so. So maybe worth Maybe what you have isn't the best way to isn't the, isn't the best way to determine your worth. 
So then I asked, okay, well, what are we worth? Let's say it's not about the money, but let's say it's about what we're made of, right? And by made of, I'm talking about the bare elements and chemicals that we're made of. So I looked up what the human body is made of, and we are made of 65% of oxygen, 18% carbon, 10% hydrogen, 3% nitrogen, 1.5% calcium, 1% phosphorus, and then from here it just gets worse and worse. 0.35% uh, potassium, 0.25% sulfur, 0.15% sodium, 0.15% chlorine, 0.05% magnesium, 0.0004% iron, and 0.0004% iodine. That's what the human body is made up of. Now, if we were to calculate the worth of all of these elements, guess how much it would come up to? $4.50. Now, we spend a lot of money on $4.50. We spend a lot of money trying to make $4.50 smell good and make $4.50 look good. We spend a lot of money on clothing, $4.50. We spend a lot of money on creating places to live for, the, for that $4.50. All so much is invested, so much time and so much effort is invested in what would be equated to just $4.50. I began to realize like we can't measure our worth or our value like that either. I don't think anybody would, would value their life as being worth only $4.50. So our worthiness cannot be determined by what we have, and it can't even be determined by what we're made up of. So what will be the one thing that determines our worth? When we look at the story of Hannah, Hannah has her biological clock ticking away in the recesses of her mind. She's trying to give birth to a child, trying to give birth, more specifically, to a male child, yet she's unable to do so. Hannah's situation is, is, is probably as traumatic as it can get in that she's living with her husband, but yet night after night, she has to wake up to the, child, to the sounds of a child crying that's not her own child. Yet another reminder of the fact that she's not able to give birth. She has to share her husband with this other woman. And capture this for a second, that means that some nights she goes to bed by herself while her husband is in bed with another woman in the same house. Capture this just for a second, that Hannah is just trying to give birth to a child, yet she's unable to do so, and the Bible tells us that she weeps and that she's bitter because of this. Now, Elkanah, the husband, is doing his best to try and work the situation out. I imagine that Elkanah is one of the most loving husbands, that he's doing all that he can to show her how much he cares for her and how much you know, he loves her. And in 1 Samuel 1 verse 7, the story continues and it says, So it was year by year when she went up to the house of the Lord that she provoked her. She being Peninnah. Peninnah provoked Hannah, right? And it says, therefore she wept and she did not even eat. Did not even eat. I don't know how many of you guys have been upset to the point where you weren't even hungry anymore. Like your just appetite is completely lost. She's there. And verse 8 says, Then Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? And why is your heart grieved? Am I, am I not better to you than ten sons? Hannah is in, such, is in a situation where she's so upset that, that, that she can't have children that she cannot even fully appreciate the love that her husband is giving to her. Her husband is trying to pour into her and trying to just show her that he cares about her. And she's still whipping and she's still crying to the point where, where, where Elkanah approaches her and is like, am I not loving you better than ten sons? Am I not showing you more affection or more, or more, um, more love than you would have experienced if you did have the children? But the issue is that Elkanah is trying to fill a void that can only be filled by God. See, he's doing all that he can to fill this void within our heart. And for some of us, it's not a relationship. For some of us, it's other things. For some of us, it's, you know, our grades, or it's um, the potential that we have in life, or it's just um, whether or not it's, you know, drugs or sex. We try to find these things that are going to fill the void because we're aware that something is missing. 
Now, I want you guys to look at this illustration here. We have a man here, and we have two hearts. Now, neither man, well, neither man is, is pretty big, right? But the heart is pretty big. And what often happens to us is that we'll either get into a relationship, or we'll get a job, or we'll get the car, or we'll get the house, or we'll start doing things like having sex, or drinking, or whatever, right? And we're expecting that those things, that one thing or a, or, or a combination of those things, is going to fill the heart. But sooner or later, you realize whether or not you marry the most beautiful woman in the world, or you marry the most handsome guy you could find, whether or not you are making all the money that you thought you would make, or not, it's just not enough to fill the void. This is what Hannah's experiencing, where you know, she, her lifestyle isn't the worst. She's okay. She just doesn't have kids. Elkanah is over here just trying to pour all that he can into her, yet he realizes, I'm not enough. What I propose that God wants to do for us is that God desires to fill our hearts so and leave enough space for everything else. So, what God wants to do is to fill the void himself. And the beautiful thing about God filling the void is that when he does fill the void, He'll leave enough room for the people that are most important and the things that are, not, uh, that are most important so that those things can be fulfilling. But those things in and of themselves will never fill the void. That's why we enter relationships and this person is always meeting this and always meeting that and always asking for this and always asking for that. And we try our best to meet those needs, yet it's never enough. Or the person is dating us. And we're asking for this, and we're asking for that. And we're asking them to fill the void that was left by a father, or, or the void that was left by a mother, or, or an emotional void that, was, that, that has been left by our experience. And we're hoping and expecting that if they're this beautiful, or if they're that smart, or if they just do this a little bit better, or if they just, you know, treat me this way, then, then finally it will be enough. But in time you realize it's not enough. And they approach you, and they're like, is not my love better than 10 X, Y, and Z? Is it? what I'm doing enough, and you recognize that it's not. Either what you've been banking on, whether it's clothes or money or fame or power, it's just never enough to fill the void. al Qaeda is a good guy, and he's doing his best to fill the void, yet unsuccessfully. And the story continues. The story continues that he goes and he feeds the kids. I forgot to tell you guys about that. So we read this before in um, the previous verse that we started out with, right? That Elkanah is trying to love her beyond her circumstance and love her beyond her condition. So he'd come back and he would have food from the sacrifices that he made. And, the, and verse 4 says, and whenever the time came for Elkanah to make offering, he would give portions to Peninnah, and then he would give a double portion to Hannah, who had no kids. Now, what's happening here is significant because he's, he's loving her in spite of her condition. He's loving her in spite of the weakness or the lack that, that she thinks she has. The beautiful thing here is that they would come back, and the, the, the man of the house would feed the people based upon the sacrifice that he bought, that he bought home. So if you're seeing this, right, maybe they're at the dinner table, and I would imagine that Elkanah would sit at the head of the table. Maybe he has Peninnah on his right and Peninnah's children. And then he has Hannah on his left, in my mind's eye, and no children. So the scene goes that he's taking out the food and that he feeds one child. He feeds um, Peninnah and then he gives food to another child, another child, another child. And then he looks at Hannah and he gives Hannah a plate. And then he gives Hannah a second plate. He gives her a plate as if she had a child there. As if she already had the child. He loves her, not according to her condition, but he loves her in spite of it. He's not valuing or measuring her worth based upon what she has or what she can produce. So scripture tells us that he gives her a double portion. And it's a beautiful thing when you find people who aren't measuring you based upon what you have. When you find people who 
are able to see beyond your situation or see beyond your condition and, and, are, and are able to love you beyond those things. I believe that, that God is able to love us in the same way and that God does love us in the same way. So Hannah being upset, even though, you know, Elkanah is doing all of this, she's still weeping, she's still crying, she, she, she still feels like that void just is not being filled within her. And she determines that she's going to pray about her situation. She determines that, that, that it's not enough that, you know, she just gets this love from her husband. So the next verse says that she went up and she, with all bitterness of heart, she prayed and she said, Lord, if you give me this child, I will give this child back to you. I'm hoping I have this verse. I think I may have left it out. If I don't have it, you guys just have to take my word for it, but I'll show you where it's found. <laughs> There. All right. It's found in um, 1 Samuel 1. It's in verse 9. Oh, okay. 1 Samuel 1, verse 9. And I'll read it for you, and you guys can carry it. It says, So Hannah arose after they finished eating and drinking in Shiloh. Now Eli, the priest, was sitting on the seat of the doorpost of the tabernacle of the Lord. And she was in bitterness of soul. She's weeping, she's crying. And she prayed to the Lord and wept in anguish. Then she made a vow and said, O Lord of hosts, if you will indeed look on my affliction or on the affliction of your maidservant and remember me and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life and no razor shall come on his head. Now what you have to catch here is especially the last verse. It says, she says that if you will give me a male child, and remember me, and not forget your maidservant, but will give your maidservant a male child, then I will give him to the Lord all the days of his life, and no razor shall come upon his head. She says, God, if you give this to me, this thing that I've been hoping for, this thing that I've been praying for, you just give it to me, I will give it back to you. Now, I'm blown away by this, because I know how important it is to have things, and not just have things, but keep things. Like, I don't like having only to have it taken away from me. If it's going to be mine, just give it to me. When people lend me stuff, I don't really like borrowing because I know that I have to give it back. And I especially can't deal with, with, with the people who give it to me and then say, no, I need it back now. Just keep it to yourself. Just let me, don't let me even think that I'll ever have it. But if I have the idea that I just might have it or I might hold on to it myself, and then you take it away from me, losing it is so much harder than, have, than not ever having it, right? People, that's why people say it's better to have loved and lost than to have never loved before. And then they lose that love and then they, they question it afterwards, right? Because the, the pain hurts so much. So Hannah prays and she says, God, if you give me this child, I will give this child back to you. Which is a very selfless prayer. I remember when I got to seminary, I met a young lady there. And, um, and you hear my language and the way I was thinking, uh, yeah, and have mercy on me, right? But I met her, beautiful woman, right? Intelligent, loves the Lord, um, just the checklist. You know, you, you know the checklist, right? You have the <laughs> list, the things that you would hope that your potential mate has, those attributes, right? She was the checklist, right? I went through it, just check, 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 check. Everything was there. I was like, oh, let's go, right? So I was excited, and I prayed about it. And I said, you know, God... Can she be mine? In my language, can, can she be mine? Can I, can I have that? As if, as if she's a person, as, as if she's a thing, right? And you know, I, I I'm praying about it, and I remember just God communicating to me. He's like, Edsel, look, she will never be yours. And I'm like, oh, devastated, right? And then, uh, but this was just a thought in my head, and I was like, but but and I felt like it kept going and saying, because she will always be mine. And I was like, whoa. And the thought occurred to me that even the things that God blesses us with, even the things that we have, don't really belong to us. You know, I looked at her, and I wanted her to be mine. But what would have happened if she were mine? I don't treat my, my stuff the best. But I know that if it belongs to you, or belongs to somebody else, and I have to return it back to you, I'm going to keep it in pretty decent condition. Because with my stuff, I get to just throw it around. 
With my stuff, I can destroy it and not feel any kind of way about it. With my stuff, I get to abuse it and just not really care. But I know if it's your stuff, that you have an expectation that I would treat it with the same respect that I have for you. We live in a society where everything is just about me. We have iPhones and iMessages and iChat and i, 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 it's just it's idolatry. It's all about us. But in this situation, I have to recognize this, it's not just about me. No offense to all the Mac lovers in the room, it's okay. I have a Mac too. But it's not just about us. And the things that are given to us and the things that we have are not just about us. We like to measure our worth based upon what we have, as if we own these things. When the word I want to share with you guys is, is steward. Do you guys know what a steward is? And I don't mean like a, um, an airplane steward, a steward is. I mean the person who plays the role of a manager, not an owner. A person who understands, and that, that's what stewardship is, uh, or stewarding is. It's to recognize that the, whatever has been placed in your possession is not really yours to own, but it's yours to borrow. It's yours to treat well, and that you value it, not, be, not based on the fact that it's yours, and not based upon the joy that it gives to you, but you value it, catch this, based upon the person who gave it. When, when a person loans you money, you're not stewarding that money. When a person loans you a car, you're stewarding that car. And you treat the car with the same respect, hopefully, that you treat the person with. The same thing happens when we're dating, the same thing happens when, when we're granted certain things. We ought to treat those things as if they're worth the person who gave it to us. So, we started out with the question of this. How do you measure your worth? Do you measure your worth by what you have? Do you measure your worth by what you're made of? Do you measure your worth based upon those things? Or is there another way to measure worth? I'm suggesting to you guys tonight that the way to measure worth is not based upon what you have or what you're made of, of but what but you measure worth based upon whose you are. Not what you are, not what you can do, but whose you are. Now the beauty of that is this. When we measure each other's worth, not based upon what a person can do or not do, but we measure them based upon, we measure their worth based upon whose they are, then you don't have to worry about people miscalculating your worth anymore. People looking at you and saying, oh, I like her makeup or I don't like her shoes, I like his haircut or I don't like something else about him. It's no longer about you. Now it's about who you actually belong to. The beautiful thing about that is that they're no longer measuring you by surface standards. They're no longer measuring you by the standards that, that can easily fade away over time. But if we measure our worth not just by what we can do, but we measure our worth based on whose we are, we're able to make the same kind of sacrifice that Hannah made. Hannah got to the point where she recognized that this child that she was, that she'd been praying for wouldn't even really belong to her. It would be loaned to her, but she'd be okay because the one who gave it to her is filling the void within her heart. See, some of the stuff we pray for and some of, the, some of the stuff we hope for, we wouldn't even really know what to do with it once we got it. We'd get it and we'd think, oh, life is complete, right? And either spiritually we'd just go off track or in some other way we'd neglect another part of life. And I believe that sometimes God withholds things from us until we're mature enough to appreciate those things properly. But not only that, but, to, but until we're mature enough so that those things don't, do, not take the, do not take over the rest of our lives. Have you ever seen a guy get an Xbox and he doesn't know what else to do with his life? Like he's just, okay, I'm talking about myself right now, right? <laughs> Have you ever seen a guy get a video game and it, that's it? Like nothing else exists for the next 30 days. He's just glued to the TV playing the game, right? And, and that thing that he's been hoping for has now taken over. Hannah is in a position where she's been praying for a child day after day after day, year after year after year, and then finally she gets the child. That's, that's the punchline to this whole story. She gets the child, but she gets it when she recognizes that I'm not getting this child to add value or worth to myself. I'm not getting this child in order to impress my husband or even to continue his lineage or to live up to the expectations of those who are around me. When I receive this child, I recognize that this child does not even completely, does, does not complete me because I have the God who gave me this child. 
So even if the child is taken away, I don't lose my identity. I don't lose who I am. So many of us, if we were to lose the most important things in our lives, we wouldn't even know who we are anymore. The things that we try to identify ourselves by. In that society, having a, ch having a child was, was all the rage. You were identified as a, as a bona fide woman if you were able to have a child. For us, it might be our grades, especially in the same. Now, I'm not saying that these things are not important. I'm just saying that these things don't define who we are. For others, it might be the job that you're hoping for, or the amount of money that you might make, or finally getting into a relationship, or making the relationship work, or finally walking down the aisle and getting married. There are so many things that, that we try to use to define ourselves and to measure our worth by. But God is saying that he just wants to fill our hearts first, so that, God forbid, some of those things, we lose them. God forbid the marriage doesn't work. God forbid your grades you know, plummet because you're depressed one semester. God forbid the worst happens, that your identity is not anchored and is not, is not fastened to those things, that your worth is not attached to those things. Hannah got to the point where she recognized that the child that she'd been praying for would not define her as being successful, would not define her as being worthy would not define her intrinsically, but she would be defined in her worth by who she belonged to. The same way we can do the same today. So, my appeal to you is simple. You know what it is in your life that if you were to lose it, you feel like you would lose everything. And I'm not saying that that feeling is ever going to go away. But, I'm saying that we can get to the point where we rely more on God than we do those things. Day after day, we see people go through things where they lose the things that they thought were the most important to them. And they, they probably were the most important to them. But how do they survive those transitions? How do they make it to the next step? How do they make it to the next level? How do they continue and how do they keep going on? Hannah figured it out eventually. We're here in college. And we have the same opportunity to learn the same lesson. That our value is not dependent upon what we have. Our worth is not dependent on what we're able to produce. But that our worth is determined by whose we are. By who we belong to. That is my hope and that is my, that is my prayer for all of us. That we recognize that we have infinite worth and infinite value. No matter what people have said about us. No matter what they may have done to us. No matter what people think or believe about us, that our worth is not determined based upon popular, um, what, what, what people popularly think about us, but that our worth is based on and dependent on who we belong, or dependent on who we belong to. We can choose to belong to a mighty and omnipotent and loving God who values us infinitely. And others ought to treat us as if we belong to that God, as if we are sons and daughters of that King. That is my hope. That is my prayer for all of you. Um, good to have you guys with us again. And I'll just close out in prayer. Father in heaven, God, we thank you for the fact that you see in us more than sometimes we see in ourselves. We thank you for the fact that you value us despite what others think of us and that you value us despite the things that have happened to us and the things that we have done. Lord, we don't want our worth and our value to be measured by what we have done and, or, what, or what has happened to us or what we're able to produce and what we have. But God, we want our value to be placed in your hand. Lord, we want others to look upon us and to recognize that we are sons and daughters of the King and to treat us accordingly, to love us accordingly not based upon how we look or what we're able to do, but in recognition of the fact that we belong to you. God, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.